There were many COVID-related scams in 2020, but the healthcare worker hotel scheme was one of the most devious. Shanette Lewis and her accomplices posted Facebook ads offering rooms to anyone for a set price per night or a single fee for a month's stay. These ads, of course, omitted that the rooms were supposed to be for healthcare workers needing quarantine space. Some ads even featured video tours of the rooms. In the ad caption, Lewis would typically offer her online guests three different options. $50 for a one-night stay, $175 for two weeks, and $300 for a whole month. Even in 2020, these prices were extremely low. Lewis's first step towards the scam was getting a job at the Office of Emergency Management Call Center. At first glance, the job looks unassuming. In reality, Lewis was a part of an emergency system to help distribute health care to people in New York who were in need, specifically people with COVID. The program was called the Hotel Room Isolation Program. In 2020, New York City's hospitals were crowded with sick patients suffering from COVID-19. The hotel program was created to house incoming healthcare workers, such as nurses and doctors, as they traveled into the crowded city. Many of New York's hospitals were understaffed at the time, so the program was their way of getting on demand healthcare workers to the sudden influx of patients, many of whom were in critical condition. To further help healthcare workers, the city offered free hotel rooms to those who qualified. The healthcare worker had to show that they couldn't safely isolate themselves to qualify. The overall goal was to ensure that healthcare workers can have a safe place to stay while treating COVID 19 patients. New York, especially Manhattan, is a playground for viruses. The city needed to do everything it could to prevent transmissions from getting out of control. As COVID-19 spread throughout New York, Lewis was one of the emergency call center workers in charge of booking the rooms for healthcare workers in the city. At some point, Lewis realized that she had access to dozens of hotel rooms across all five boroughs, and the government would pay for each one she booked, as long as she ordered the room through her office, of course. The program started in March of 2020, just as COVID started ripping through the United States. Then, in April, Lewis and her team kicked off their scheme, making their best effort to market the hundreds of hotel rooms at their fingertips. They used online ads to lure in potential guests and took videos of the actual hotel rooms to show that their offers were genuine. They wound up posting most of their ads on Facebook. But Lewis and her accomplices were going for volume more than high profits. They wanted to find people in New York with little money and no place to stay. It didn't matter whether they were healthcare workers, homeless people, or people traveling to the city. The ads also mentioned that the rooms were only available within the city limits of New York's five boroughs. The city-sponsored hotel room program only extended to hotels in New York, so Lewis was handcuffed to the city limits. She was also limited in letting her guests choose where they wanted to stay, a privilege offered by most hotel agencies like Priceline and Kayak. Nevertheless, Lewis didn't let the geographical limitations and lack of service quality keep her from booking a ton of rooms. Lewis booked her own room for 28 days to save some money for herself. The program only allowed qualifying healthcare workers to stay for 14 days. Other than paying for food and gas, the city of New York paid for her entire stay, which was extraordinarily expensive, even by big city standards. A big hook in Lewis's marketing was that the hotel rooms were in five-star establishments, as her Facebook records show. One of her messages said that Lewis offered five-star hotels for 60% off. While there's no guarantee what hotel you'll stay at, she does guarantee five-star treatment. Lewis finishes her message by telling her guests that they should have their cash app ready. All in all, Lewis and her accomplices rented out 2,700 nights to their guests. These nights amounted to $400,000 in room fees, all on the city of New York's dollar. Meanwhile, Lewis was making some serious money. In a private Facebook message to a potential associate, Lewis said they made $16,000 in just five days. Lewis also mentions that she's proud of herself for all the money she was making. Lewis used her success to lure other people into the scam. Three primary suspects were involved who helped Lewis grow the scheme to new heights. Tatiana Benjamin, Tatiana Daniel, and Heaven West. Lewis approached Benjamin first. She messaged her on Facebook explaining how the scheme worked and how much money she could make if she joined. Lewis offered to teach Benjamin the ropes of it and revealed that she had access to the information that the city uses to book the rooms, such as the applicant's info, 
She also discussed another scheme she was running at the time involving fraudulent unemployment benefits. Benjamin was interested in working with Lewis. She realized the earning potential and that it wouldn't be around forever. She messaged Lewis saying, quote, let's go get this bread while this thing is still active. As her message indicates, Benjamin knew the hotel room program wouldn't last. It was just to alleviate the current viral emergency. She also knew that the authorities would come for them sooner than later, which turned out to be an advantage later on. Like her friend Lewis, Benjamin stayed in the hotel rooms using the program's money. Investigators allege she stayed in one room for 14 nights while claiming to be a respiratory therapist. After getting Benjamin on board, Lewis recruited Daniel, who also masqueraded as a respiratory therapist. Lewis also recruited a 20-year-old Wes to work with Daniel, while Benjamin spent most of her time working with Lewis. Perhaps it was West's inexperience that led to the group's downfall. At one point, West had to deal with an angry customer. However, she unknowingly explained how the scam worked to calm them down, thus incriminating herself and the team in the process. The guests hadn't received the room information yet after sending $200 to West on Cash App. The guest sent a message to West complaining about the botched transaction and asked for a refund. West wrote back to the guest, denying their refund because this particular customer was the only one giving her trouble. West gave the customer a new room, but only after candidly pointing out that the hotels were drastically discounted, and she was one of the few people who could access the free rooms. The quartet worked hard to create an efficient system designed to get as many people booked in a room before the program halted. They all had nicknames like a heist movie. Lewis was called Nettie Hot. Benjamin was referred to as To Banks and on other occasions as Lyric Mother. Daniel was named Kimura Daniel. However, Wes didn't have any nicknames that investigators knew of. Lewis provided Benjamin with specific codes, passwords, and personal identity information to pass on the system to her accomplices, including her own employee ID number and license number and doctor's personal information. Because of the desperate nature of their marketing, the scheme attracted a lot of desperate and unsavory characters. One hotel complained of guests who totally trashed their room after throwing massive parties. The brazen nature of Lewis's scheme eventually caught the attention of New York City, who looked into the matter and discovered they were missing $400,000. In July of 2020, Lewis and Benjamin were booking a room for a new guest like they'd done hundreds of times before, until Lewis noticed that the city had canceled the reservation. Benjamin messaged Lewis saying, quote, We going to jail. She was right. Lewis and Daniel were arrested in New York shortly after the surprise room cancellation. West was also arrested in Atlanta. Meanwhile, authorities couldn't find Benjamin. It's unclear how she managed to hide, but she's been missing since the charges were filed against the hotel room scammers. She was still at large as of October 2021. Back in the New York courtrooms, Lewis was in a lot of trouble. Investigators were livid. She played the city twice once with hotel rooms, and another with unemployment benefits fraud. As mentioned earlier, Lewis was also involved in an unemployment scam. Local authorities charged Lewis with fraudulently obtaining government benefits meant for people who couldn't work. Lewis, of course, was perfectly able to work, but stopped coming in around February 2020. Nevertheless, she managed to work at the call center and book rooms. In total, Lewis claimed over $45,000 in unemployment benefits from February to July 2020. While it's impossible to measure the damage these four did to people's health and well-being, the toll is probably high. After all, they rented 2,700 nights to people who didn't need it. Nights meant for frontline workers in the early stages of a global pandemic. This is what happens when female psychopaths start scamming? Let's get right into it. Number four, city girls behind city bars. Before city girls, singer JT was known as Jatavia Johnson, a Miami girl who came from nothing. Hailing from a bad neighborhood, JT was among the youngest of 16 brothers and sisters. After she reached seventh grade, JT was put out on her own, sometimes staying with an aunt and other times crashing at friends' houses. JT had various day jobs from Whole Foods to Burger King, always working, but still struggling to make ends meet. Getting fed up with the life she had, JT used a handful of stolen credit card numbers to buy clothes and various gift cards she felt she deserved. 
JT showed off this time of her life in photos she posted on her social media. Gifts for her niece, a digital camera for a vacation, makeup artists for night outs with the girls. She was eventually arrested in June of 2017 at a Nordstrom after buying a pair of shoes. Shortly after her arrest, JT and the other half of City Girls, Young Miami, were discovered by hip-hop label Quality Control. And by Christmas, City Girls had released their first official single, a song we're not going to repeat. We're pretty sure this song isn't going to challenge Mariah Carey for a most played song at Christmas anytime soon. Also released around the same time was Where the Bag At, a song about demanding money where JT repeats deeply poetic lines describing that she needs someone, quote, who gonna swipe them visas? This likely didn't help her case. JT pled guilty to aggravated identity theft and was sentenced to 24 months in federal prison. Her lawyer provided a schedule of upcoming City Girl shows leading up to a major appearance at the BET Awards in June of that year, so the judge agreed to push back JT's surrender date. Then, a week before she was set to go in, JT's lawyer requested another delay on account of a recent co-sign with Canada's favorite son, Drake, leaning in to the fact that JT was a rising superstar in the hip-hop industry. The requested extension wasn't fully granted, but JT was permitted to perform at the award show and finish her verse for Drake. After completing her commitments, JT honored her sentence and showed up to serve her time. JT began her prison term in July 2018 and was set to be released on March 1, 2020. In the meantime, City Girls continued to release singles and tracks with the other half of the group, Young Miami doing everything she could to promote their music. In an attempt to get an early release, JT argued her good behavior for over a year should qualify her, leaving about eight and a half months of her sentence remaining. While the request was denied, JT was transferred to a halfway house five months before her scheduled release, allowing her to continue her career. Since her incarceration and release, JT has amassed a net worth of one and a half million dollars. That net worth mostly comes from the group's high appearance fees. They charge $40,000 for TV appearances and $15,000 for nightclub appearances. Looks like she found a new way to rip people off. Number three, her mantra was to steal. Amanda Knorr, 35, was one of three people charged over a green energy scheme that defrauded over 300 investors. Knorr and her college boyfriend, Troy Rag, founded Montracor. Knorr's company, Mantra, focused on green community development, socially responsible investing, distressed real estate fund management, mortgage banking, renewable energy, music and entertainment, and philanthropy. So pretty much everything. The couple received more than $54 million from hundreds of investors within four years based on promises of technology that would turn trash into fuel and carbon negative housing developments, neither of which were ever fully developed. Montracor is known as the largest green energy scam the U.S. has ever seen. Many victims lost their entire life savings. Mantra was a Ponzi scheme in which new investor money was used to pay earnings to prior investors, often without any actual product being sold. Mantra's pitch was centered primarily around a venture to produce biochar and a green real estate development in Tennessee. Biochar is a charcoal-like substance made by burning organic material in a process called pyrolysis. Biochar was supposed to take waste like used tires and household garbage and convert it into an energy source and a fertilizer. By spreading this stuff all over your field, it could pull toxins out of the atmosphere. Knorr and Rag were both honored by former President Bill Clinton, a real pillar of morality himself, during a 2009 ceremony for the Clinton Global Initiative for their plans to develop biochar technology that they said would sequester carbon dioxide and reduce emissions in developing countries. Knorr and Rag lied to investors, along with Colorado Wealth Advisor Wade McKelvey. McKelvey ran Get Rich Quick seminars to pitch their biochar technology and a carbon-negative housing development in Tennessee. Through his Speed of Wealth the seminars, one featuring John Elway, McElvey overstated claims that Mantra had already made millions of dollars and promised investment returns as high as 484%. 
McLevy specifically targeted elderly investors and taught them how to liquidate all their assets, such as mutual funds and 401k plans, then told them to take out as many loans as possible and invest it all in Mantra. Many of them did. However, Mantra's environmental initiatives hadn't been profitable. Biochar is very expensive to produce, and Mantra only had one plant that was just starting out, not the claimed 25. The housing development wasn't anything more than vacant lots resold at a loss, and the early returns paid to investors had been funded almost exclusively from new investments. So where did all these retirees' life savings go? Rag claims he didn't spend lavishly, despite the influx of millions to their company, merely living in a 1,200 square foot home and said there was no Lamborghini parked out front. He was, however, driving around in a Mercedes SLK 350 with a Mantra vanity license plate. Granted, it's not an elite luxury vehicle, but it's not a Honda Civic either. Along with funding their lifestyles, there was the creation of Mantra Records, a record label that invested money in a rapper called Ice Block. Mantra Records funded a music video for Ice Block that ridiculously featured Rag and Noor. A lawsuit was able to recover about $6 million for victims of the scheme. Another $800,000 was placed in a receivership, but has yet to be paid out. Of the $54 million invested in Mantra, $17 million had been paid out to early investors. But when the Securities Exchange Commission shut Mantra down, only $790,000 remained from the other $37 million. Nor and Rag both pled guilty after being charged. While out on bail waiting for his sentence, Rag hatched another scheme where he solicited an investment in an online video dating service that was about to be purchased by a well-known entrepreneur. Of course, there was no deal, and the victim lost her entire investment. Troy Rag was deemed a continued threat to the public and received a harsher sentence of 22 years in prison and $54 million restitution. Wade McKelvey was sentenced to 18 years in prison, five years of supervised release, and ordered to pay $37 million restitution. Amanda Knorr was sentenced in Philadelphia federal court to only 30 months in federal prison and ordered to pay $37 million restitution. Maybe these three should invest in a little morality. Number two, give me your tax returns. Tanya M. Fox spent $4 million on a BMW 7 Series, an Infiniti M35, a Chrysler Crossfire, Volkswagen Beetle, and a Maserati, two cosmetic surgeries, and she opened a restaurant in Orlando, Florida. But Fox didn't earn her $4 million the old-fashioned way our fathers and grandfathers did, by playing the state lottery. She actually opened bank accounts in the name of fake tax prep businesses to file for fraudulent returns, then used other people to withdraw those returns. Fox filed over $3,000 1,590 false tax returns on behalf of 3,023 different victims. Fox used social security numbers, dates of birth, and names of patients, most of whom were teenagers, at the health department to file the returns and obtain nearly $4.1 million. Two health department employees, Shantaresha Smith and Gerald Williams, and Williams' brother Delray Duncan, were arrested, admitting that they were paid roughly $45,000 to steal patients' information. The investigation started when sheriffs were searching a house and discovered a handwritten list with about 150 names, dates of birth and social security numbers. During her trial, Fox was deemed the mastermind behind the scheme. Given the more severe punishment of 20 years for aggravated identity theft, wire fraud, and conspiracy, as well as theft of government property. While the sentence was viewed by some as harsh, the judge brought up the aggravating factor of bribing three members of the health department to get her hands on the identities. Further, the majority of the stolen identities belong to teenagers who will be unaware that their identities have been stolen and the problems that will create until they try to buy a house or a car in the future. All of Fox's assets were seized in order to pay restitution. Her co-conspirator, Gerald Williams, received four and a half years, Delray Duncan got three and a half, and Shantarika Smith was sentenced to five years. Number one, Queen Tax Fraud. Rashia Wilson was the self-proclaimed queen of IRS tax fraud. Apparently, tax fraud has a monarchy? She posted a message on Facebook in all capital letters for emphasis, claiming that she's a millionaire for the record, so if we had thought the police indicting her would be easy, it wouldn't be. Honestly, we thought it would have been easy. Wilson promised us that we need more than, quote, black and white to hold her down. 
That was the message to the rat who went and told on her, although her meaning still seems a bit vague. Wilson's post goes on in disbelief about the police's possible indictment plans, as if the first lady, so wait, now she's not a queen? Didn't have the Tampa Bay Police Department under her spell. Wait, she's a witch now? Her Majesty reminded us that at the moment, she ran Tampa so she wouldn't have to do any time. But Wilson obviously meant no time other than the 21 years she had gotten for wire fraud, aggravated identity theft, and being a felon, queen, witch, in possession of a firearm. From April 2009 to September 2012, Queen and First Lady Horatia Wilson and her co-conspirator Maurice J. Larry ran a scheme to defraud the Internal Revenue Service by fraudulently obtaining tax refunds. They received U.S. Treasury checks and prepaid debit cards that were loaded with funds derived from filing false income tax returns in other people's names. Wilson and Larry filed these tax returns from various locations, including Wilson's own home and various hotels throughout Tampa. Wilson and Larry then used these refunds to make hundreds of thousands of dollars in retail purchases to buy money orders and to withdraw cash. During the unpredicted investigation, agents searched Wilson's house and Larry's storage unit where they discovered thousands of names and social security numbers. Agents also found high-end accessories, jewelry, and a firearm in Wilson's home. Further additional reloadable debit cards loaded with fraudulent tax refunds were found in both locations. Wilson, who often referred to herself as the First Lady and Queen of Tax Fraud, title she chose for herself, spent $30,000 on her daughter's first birthday party and had purchased a new Audi for $90,000. The IRS estimated that the actual loss from Wilson and Larry's scheme was $2,240,096.39, though the royal couple's potential theft was in excess of $11 million. At her trial, Wilson's defense brought in a psychologist who explained that she suffers from bipolar disorder that was first diagnosed from a young age and that the absurd bragging is consistent with her disorder. Wilson had a rough upbringing, struggled in school, and eventually dropped out. However, the judge couldn't ignore the fact that Wilson stole over $3 million from the government. An unfortunate upbringing with a mental disorder didn't give her a pass. The judge sentenced Rashia Wilson to 21 years in federal prison for wire fraud aggravated identity theft and being a felon in possession of a firearm as well as the forfeiture of $2,240,096.39 which constitutes the proceeds traceable to the offense. This was quite an unusually hefty sentence for the amount of money she had stolen. In fact, a petition was set up on change.org calling for a lesser sentence for her. It probably didn't help her case that she chose to scam the government and that she talked trash while doing it. Click to watch one of these next videos and let us know in the comment section. Would you rather quarantine in a hotel for seven straight days or have to run or walk 10 miles?